Thank you all for coming tonight. It is, I'm Tony Jensen, if you haven't been around the conference. Um, I am a graduate of the PhD program here at Texas Tech University, and I teach now in the um, programs in creative writing and translation at University of Arkansas. And Stephen Jones was my teacher. So my introduction is going to be a little bit about Stephen as a teacher, and then you know the usual that probably a lot of you already know about Stephen as a writer. My first semester as a PhD student at Texas Tech, I took a literature class focusing on the interconnected novels of Louise Erdrich, taught by Stephen Graham Jones. I think there were seven or eight of those Machi Manitou novels back then, and there are quite a few more now. The syllabus for that class mentioned how its primary aim was to compel us to fall in love with Erdrich's books. The other memorable line was that we were not studying dream catchers. There would be no drumming. Erdrich already was my favorite writer, and with his no dream catcher, no drumming clause, Stephen, of course, became my favorite teacher in that my very first week. And I watched that semester as Erdrich's words and world became sharper and clearer for my classmates as well, as Stephen led us through those novels. After that class, and often during the next four years, I sat in Stephen's workshops and literature courses, having these moments, watching everyone's fiction improve, their understanding grow of literature they otherwise might have overlooked. The primary, necessary texts of writers like Louise Erdrich and James Welch and Gerald Visner, alongside Pynchon and Cheever. That semester, and those that followed, I also, time to time, would have another student want to tell me how to better write Meti stories and poems, which was fine, that's the other students' jobs. But at the level of the Meti, um, at the level of crafting indigenous characters, they were pretty sure I wasn't doing it right sometimes. Um, often they wanted more plight or more dream catchers or more drumming. I was able to keep a straight, blank face through many of these times, though not all, and it's because I had someone on the faculty to whom I could say, oh wow, and I'm working on my dream catcher, who, knew, who I knew would sympathize, would laugh, would intercede if I wanted, but not if I didn't. The value of that knowing cannot be understated. And since then, um, Stephen also has been a champion of my work and my teaching life, helping me to get a part-time position at Institute of American Indian Arts, reminding John Davis, who runs the program there, about me. Um, and so now, in addition to our past connections, we have the current connection. A former student of mine, fine Anishinaabe writer named David Tremblay, is working with Stephen this semester. So I quite like how um, things are sort of going all the way around now that a student I've had is um, now Stephen's student, and I, Stephen probably doesn't know this, but I get updates from David about how great <laughs> Stephen is as a teacher, and I keep very patiently saying, yes, I know, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm aware of that, thanks. So, um, so a little bit about Stephen's work. He is the author of 16 novels and six story collections. Is that right, or has it grown? It's close, yeah, we never know for sure. Most recent, maybe, is the werewolf novel Mongrels from William Morrow. Next are the comic book My Hero from Hex Publishers and Mapping the Interior from Tor. Stephen lives and teaches in Boulder, Colorado. And why I say are we sure is because of, co of course, in addition to him being a tremendous writer of all manner of literature, he is also prolific. Um, so much so that he's reading something that he wrote very recently, perhaps even last night, and I look forward to hearing the new work, um, full of humor, no dream catchers, uh, probably a dog will die. These are my predictions for these stories. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Stephen Graham Jones. Thank you all for coming out. This is a cool, it's, it's cool to be back on campus. I, I like it a lot. Although I went to the I went over to cruise through the library when I used to work for Diane in book cataloging. I'd get, you know, 15 minute breaks. This is the late 90s. And I would go cruise the stacks, just walk through the stacks. And, um, and I took the elevator up and I ended up in some weird place I'd never been before. And um, the people up there had to direct me to this. I couldn't even remember how to get to the stacks. It was terrible. I, I, feel, I felt so embarrassed, man. Um, and the campus has changed so much. There's new, every time I, like, what used to be open spaces is walls now, or buildings. It's neat. Um, neat and scary, I guess. Um, let's see. 
is John here? I was going to read a point. This John is not here. Okay. Well, I'll read this anyways. Um, today, instead of eating tacos like I should have, I snuck off to Fur's Cafeteria, which is my favorite place of all to eat in the world. Um, because we don't have one in Colorado. We had one when I first moved up there. It was about 40 miles away, and we'd make the trek once a week, me and my family, to eat there. And um, the way I knew it was a good place was I'm there. I'm, I snuck over there one Sunday by myself and um, ran into one of my cousins from Montana. He was coming through Colorado, and he thought, I better stop at first. And so it, it's it, it's just a good place, you know. Um, and Actually, the last time I was in town, I want to say it was, I don't know, 12 or 13, somewhere around there. I went to the furs that went up on Slide Road, and um, they remembered me. They remembered what I ate from being here, from eating here so much between 2000 and 2008 or something. Um, and they still got good food, man. Um, although the number of furs is in town has dwindled, there's only two, isn't there? That's getting rough. Y'all are in a crunch, I think. Um, there used to be four when I was here, you know? That was that was happiness. Um, I mean, it's still happiness compared to Colorado, but... Um, and also, Whataburger. We don't have this in Colorado. <laughs> Man. Mm. Yeah, so good. Um, anyway, here's a story that's about eating at furs. Lunch. The girl I trade jokes with at the cafeteria I eat at on Mondays has a new one for me this time. Her son is going to live with his grandmother for a while. I ask her why. We're laughing in our way. Her filling tea glasses me sliding two pieces of pie onto one saucer like they let me do. And she says she's sending him to her mother's because this morning when she went in to wake him for school, his breath was white because he, he, she doesn't have a heater in her house. But her mother does, one of those big ones that shoots heat up through a vent in the living room. And then she nods for me to take my pie, that it's okay. At one point, a few minutes later, eating whatever I'm eating, I see a guy about 25 stand up from his table, then pull his dad. I think it's his dad anyway, but it could be a boss, I guess. But what the guy does is pull up from his plate and arrange himself into the very specific shape he needs him to be in to properly show this complicated karate move he saw on a show last night, or just thought of, maybe. Either way, his face, when he slow motions through the move, is deadly serious, and he does the sound effects, too or holds his lips like he's making the sounds, and I look away, want to fall in love with something, the first thing I see but close my eyes instead, know that next week and the week after, I'll be eating in a different place. And I, you know, I remember that, that day that um, I saw that guy at first doing that karate move. I pulled out, and I was waiting there at, by McDonald's on slide to go wherever I was going, and um. Across the across the road on the sidewalk was two dudes coming on bicycles, and they were um, those religious people that knock on your door and tell you stuff, you know, and um, that wear nice clothes on bicycles, and um, and and the guy in front was just pedaling along, his tie kind of slung over his shoulder, and the guy behind him was trying so hard to do a wheelie the whole way they passed me, and that made me so intensely happy that I um, I'm not, I can't I can't capture that on paper. I can get the karate guy on paper, but I can't get that wheelie dude on paper. Not yet, anyways. Here's another short one. It's this long. Um, I do a lot of stories this long. Uh, short attention span, I don't know what it is. But um, truth is a bearded lady. My husband has two hearts. He told me. When he was a kid, sideshow people were always lurking around to kidnap him into the carnival. But he got away each time, just barely. If he hadn't, we wouldn't be together right now. But he only tells me about his second heart. His other wife thinks he's like everybody else. She thinks he just has one heart, could just love one woman. I know the truth, though. He trusts me with all his secrets. If either of his hearts is bigger, then it's the one he's given me. I wrote that during a commercial. We were, I was watching Star Trek with my kids, Star Trek Next Generation, of course. And, um, and we got into an argument about who would win in a fight. Um, Data or Doctor Who? And um, I thought it was Data, because Data's an android, you know? He's, he's really tough. He's got cylinders for muscles, you know? And he's made of metal. But um, my kids, and so I was just, you know, battering my kids down with my wonderful argument. And um, then, one of my, then my daughter says, yeah, but Doctor Who has two hearts. And I just had to stop for a while. I had no idea Doctor Who had two hearts. Does everybody know this? Nobody? He doesn't? Or, yeah, no? yeah, OK. They could have been putting me on. They're not the most honest of kids. <laughs> 
Um, so, so then, since I was kind of losing the argument, I just got quiet and wrote a story instead, which is what I always do. You know, um, I lose a lot of arguments. Um, I wrote this one about three weeks ago, I think. I haven't haven't mailed it out anywhere. Let me make sure all the pages are here. I'm always terrified that I'm going to do that. Yeah, I think I'm good. Thank you for printing it, Diane. Um, it's called, So This Is What It's Like. It's my first time to ever read it. It's kind of scary. <laughs> when Evelyn stood from the car, she wasn't sure she was seeing what she was seeing. Her husband's bald head, not just cresting over the tall fence of their wide backyard, but cresting and rising and rising. Terry, she said. He was on the trampoline, the one their son Marty had assembled for them for when his clutch of kids was over and had energy to burn. Evelyn started to pull off her sunglasses to be sure, sure about this, but stopped at the last moment. They weren't her sunglasses. They were the dark wraparound ones the doctor had told her, told her to leave on for at least an hour from having her eyes dilated. Technically, she wasn't supposed to have driven home. Most days, she could expect a friendly chiding from Terry about taking such chances at her age, at their age. Not today. Evelyn took a step in what direction she wasn't sure, more just to confirm that the driveway was still there under her. She reached out for the side of the car to steady herself. The metal was hot and her skin was thin, both. Terry rose up again, his arms expanding at the top of his jump, an expression on his face of not amusement, wonder. Whatever could have possessed him to climb up, climb up there. Instead of going into the house through the back door, Evelyn figured out the complicated latch of the gate, stepped gingerly into the backyard, into this thing that was, apparently, really happening. The springs creaked with Terry's weight, then launched him back up into the sky. Since the grandkids had come up with what they called air dodge basketball, the safety netting that had guarded them from falling off the trampoline, it was now the trampoline's bed skirt, you're going to kill yourself, Evelyn called out and was surprised to hear her voice crack. At the top of his jump, Terry rotated his head around, targeting in on her voice, and then gravity pulled him down again, fast enough that it took Evelyn's breath away. Creak, launch, hang. Ev, Terry called down, his voice not the kind of steady she was expecting if he was having fun, if he was doing this to surprise her. What are you doing, Evelyn said back. She was to the side of the trampoline now. Her fingers wrapped around the frame just enough to, to double back, touch her palm. I can't, Terry started, apparently out of breath as well. Then once he'd shot up again, he got out what he was trying to tell her. Can't stop. Evelyn was tracking his ascent and descent with her whole head. What do you mean, she said, both hands of the trampoline's curved frame now, so she wouldn't fall backwards, trying to keep him in her field of vision. Why are you up there? Her voice wasn't shrieky yet, but it was climbing. It was close. Call the, call the, Terry said in his broken, up-and-down way. Fire department, Evelyn said, her face warming with emergency. Just stop jumping. I can't, Terry said back. Evelyn backed off to try to reassess, to try to make sense of this, to look for some great hook she could pluck him from the air with, for a lever to slow the trampoline's bounce down for anything. Terry was right in the center of the black, of the black elastic mat, the perfect spot where the grandkids always tried to get to reach the highest, hang up there the longest. It had gotten to where Evelyn couldn't watch them anymore now that the safety net wasn't there to catch them. They were young, she told herself when they were over. Their bones would knit. Terry wouldn't. She could see it now, too, what he meant, the fix he was in. It wasn't that he was voluntarily jumping anymore. It was that every time he came down, he was having to flex his knees to absorb some of that fall to keep his bad knee from going out. And then he was pushing back to keep from collapsing to the trampoline that counted as a jump. If he, tried to, if he tried to stop, he'd slump over frontwards or backwards or to one side or the other, and the trampoline would meet him coming up. And she'd seen this a hundred times already with the grandkids. He would launch across at a crazy angle, either to the other side of the trampoline to then bounce back the other direction or to tangle in the springs, or half a foot farther, the frame. It would break her husband of 49 years and a half. Evelyn steepled her hands over her mouth, shook her head, no. Just, just, she said, but there was nothing, no advice, no way out. Terry was trapped. And what could the fire department or the police even do? Tackling him mid-jump would be a disaster. 
Cutting the trampoline open under him would break his legs, even if they were able to get a pad up under there. If they could somehow lean a ladder over, they could pluck him at the top of his ascent, she supposed. But his legs weren't going to last long enough for that kind of truck, for them to lay the back fence over. Evelyn clawed her phone up from her purse anyway. Of course, she couldn't open it now, of all times. Right when the operator answered, asking about the emergency, Terry grunted. As he rose, Evelyn saw what had happened. His bad knee. It was going. It was gone. Evelyn dropped the phone into the grass, rushed to the frame again, had the vision of yanking hard to the side, throwing this contraption behind her over the house into the street, and then diving forward to catch Terry to keep him from hitting the ground. Terry, she said. He was floating 20 feet in the sky now, his shirt floating away from him, his eyes wide with uncertainty, his bad knee pulled up higher than the other to protect it. Coming down this time, he was fixed on her the whole time. He was calmer now. Evelyn shook her head, no, please. He wasn't calm. He was ready. This time, this jump, one leg was enough. He didn't collapse, but he was having to bend deeper, push back harder. It launched him even higher. The grandkids would be running around the trampoline with delight, she knew. Grandpa was going to win. He was going to go higher than anybody. <laughs> you stupid old fool, Evelyn called up to him. Terry looked down at her like an apology, like he was caught. Like, what could you do? He was still the same boy he'd been at 22, at 38, at 55. He'd had to try, hadn't he? The trampoline had been there through the window for going on two years. For two years, he'd been watching it. For two years, he'd been wondering, talking himself out of it, but then coming back to be sure. Go inside, he said, out of breath, sinking into the shiny blackness on one foot, nearly at her level for an instant. From the grass, Evelyn's telephone was saying something. She sucked her breath in when Terry rocketed up again, and her chest swelled and swelled. And the way he said that for her to go inside, he was still looking out for her. It's what he'd told her when the sheriff's car had pulled up during Marty's high school. It's what he'd told her when the neighborhood kids had masked their door, yelling about what had just happened to Clade, their second dog. It's what he told her in their first house when the sky was heavy and green, heavy and, green and swirling. Evelyn stepped out of her shoes. Her hands were still wrapped around the cold tube around the edge of the trampoline. Wait, she said, tracking him up and down, trying to get the rhythm right. Wait for me. And the last thing she did before stepping up was peel out of the doctor's sunglasses so she could look up into the bright, bright sky, see her husband hanging there, waiting for her. <laughs> so a dog did die. I didn't even realize that. <laughs> It's so hard to keep dogs alive in fiction. It's like nearly impossible. <laughs> um, how about this? Is, I wrote this on the plane last night. What, like this book is coming out, Mapping the Interior is coming out in June, and so the publisher Tor is hitting me up for you know that kind of promotional stuff that they like you to do that's associated with the book, and um, so they can run it on their site. And my assignment for this one was to write um, a thousand words on the book that changed me the most. And um, I failed because I think my word count is 994. But maybe on rewrite, I'll find some more adjectives or something. I don't know. <laughs> or once I title it, maybe it'll be none, maybe it'll be 1,000. Um, I print all this stuff at like 13 or 14-point 4, font because I never can remember to have my glasses. But it's really nice. It's like Fisher Price font. It's, it's, it's great. Um, <laughs> Uh, all right. Jim Shooter wrote the book that changed my life, the book that, I'm confident, landed me here. Here's how it happened. I'm 12 years old. We live way out in the country in West Texas, maybe 15 miles east of Midland, an actual city, probably 90,000 people then, thanks to the oil boom, but we're not quite to Stanton, a little place of about 3,000. Stanton's big compared to where we live, Greenwood. No post office, no mention on the map. Just a school and a church on the same grounds, and lots of cotton fields, lots of pump jacks, lots of pastures, and every few miles a house, a trailer out in the mesquite. Every couple of weeks, my mom would load me and my two brothers, my two little brothers, up, and we'd head into Midland for groceries. It was a big event. Just shy of Midland, there was this gas station, Pecan Grove. We'd each get fifty or seventy-five cents and get to go in and buy a Coke. Cokes were very rare in our lives. One of those times, the gym shooter time, on the race back to the cooler for a Big Red or a Dr. Pepper, I saw something I hadn't seen before. 
comic books, a round rack of them. Understand, at 12 years old, I'd never been to the theater to see a movie. All I knew about Star Wars was a page I studied and studied in the J.C. Penney's catalog I had to leave in the living room because I'd stay up all night looking at it. This is where things start for me, there in Pecan Grove. I'm staring at a comic book. I'm staring at the Incredible Hulk on the cover of issue number four of Secret Wars. He's green, even his hair. And to save his friends, he's holding up 150 billion tons of rock. I walk out of Pecan, Pecan Grove without a Coke, yes. And then over the next few months, I'm always scrambling over my brothers to get to that round rack in Pecan Grove. I wouldn't get to read Secret Wars in sequence until years later. The kids in the trailers behind Pecan Grove were probably nabbing the issues, but I was able to read a few of them. Specifically, I was able to read issue 10. In the 33 years since that day, I found the Hulk holding a mountain up. I've read thousands of books, thousands of comics, and they've all left their print on me. They've all left me a different person, but none so much as issue 10 of Secret Wars. If you don't know it, Secret Wars is all Earth's mightiest heroes and villains getting spirited away to this battle planet for a sort of tournament of champions. So this omnipotent entity, the Beyonder, can watch them struggle and perhaps understand this strange to him concept of desire. It makes for some cool fights, fun reversals, unexpected allies, character changing developments, and of course lots of heroics and dark brooding. Chief among the brooders is Dr. Doom. Never content with the hand he's dealt, Doom elects to try to change the nature of the game itself. He goes after the Beyonder to steal his limitless power with a specially modified chest plate, one that only works at about arm's length. This is an enterprise with no hope, of course. Not only is a Beyonder all-powerful, but Doom's a bad guy, and bad guys don't win, right? But look at that cover of issue 10. Doom's green tunic is in rags. His metal armor has been shredded away. He's bleeding, he's broken, he's crackling and smoldering. This is what happens when you slog through wave after wave of energy hurled at you by an omnipotent being. This had to sell in the magazine rack so the cover couldn't show it, but Doom's leg had even been burned off. There's no way he can live, no way he can make it, even one step closer to the Beyonder. Yet he does. He's Doom. Away, he says. There must be... He's hurt, he's bleeding, he's destroyed. This is impossible, this is stupid and crazy, but that doesn't stop him. Then Beyonder, in all his vast innocence, he draws close enough for Doom's chest plate to activate, and Doom, like that, steals the power infinite, all because he wouldn't give up, all because he kept going. That year, 1984, a lot of craziness started for our family and left us moving all across Texas just trying to stay together. A lot of bad situations. I was always a new kid at school. I was always having to prove myself on the playground, on the basketball court, in the parking lot, under the bleachers, in the principal's office, in the back of cop cars, on a pump jack, on a horse, under a hood. But each new hallway I walked into, each next job, each next whatever, I would set my eyes like Dr. Doom in issue 10, and I would tell myself that I would keep walking no matter what came at me, no matter the injury, no matter the chances, no matter the teachers, Standing me up in front of class is example to the rest of somebody they should all look up when I was 20 to see if I was still so funny. I kept going. I kept insisting. And yeah, I ran away into the pastures and the trees in the night and worse so many times, but I always came back because of doom. Doom wouldn't have given up. Doom would have insisted on seeing this hopeless enterprise through. So I did too. Secret Wars 10 didn't turn me into a writer. Secret Wars 10, it kept me alive through all of my secret wars. Without it, there's no me. Thank you, Jim Shooter. Hopefully we all find a book like that when we're 12 years old, right? Um, how about... I don't know, I've got a Neanderthal story and a Muppet story. Um, I've never read this one out loud. This one just came out in the Denver Quarterly. It's the Neanderthal story. Um, my wife says I'm such a snob for saying Neanderthal, because I talk about it a lot around the house. I follow her around and tell her about Neanderthals, and um, she's not really interested, but um, <laughs> she can't get away either, you know? Um, but, she, but she says it's Neanderthal, and it was Neanderthal for a long time, but then, Germ then the Germans like reorganized their language. Like what it is, is 
it, the reason that they're called Neanderthals is because Neander, it's the Neander Valley. Well, it's the Neander Valley, but the way you say valley in German is tall, T-A-L, but in, it, in the old spellings, it was T-H-A-L. Then when they kind of standardized their spelling, it became T-A-L, so Neanderthal is the proper way to spell it, but that's not a convincing argument to my wife. Man, um, <laughs> All right, tree of hominids. Should I meet a Neanderthal, I will give him all the Tupperware I have on me, and I will walk with him for a block or two, attempting to converse with him via grunts and head tilts, careful to keep my hands from gesturing too expansively, as I wouldn't want to frighten him, nor incur his response to being frightened. Will I concern myself with being up or down wind of him, I wonder, or would that be his concern? Will my absence of scent be as alarming, as alarming to him as the whole of the modern world swirling around us? I imagine that to him I might be a scentless ghost, should the immaterial puzzle into his conceptual abilities. But it must. Is loss not one of the first lessons you learn? Swirling in his head will be the gossamer traces of those he's known, mates and siblings and parents and children, all of whom rise in his memory when handling this tool and walking that ridge when the sun strikes his face a certain way. Looking into the fire night after night, he surely sensed the dim shadows of everyone no longer extending their thick, bent fingers to those flames. Perhaps everyone, wait, perhaps this is where I let the side of my hand brush his to prove that I'm really here, and that he is as well. It's the small gestures that have the largest impact, right? Halfway through our walk now, our brief relationship already drawn to a close, I, of course, have to assume some approaching awkwardness. Not at the pending permanent farewell, he has his world, I mine, but from the water or stub of meat he probably has secreted about this, se secreted about, secret, how do you say that, secreted? It's not secreted, secreted? Okay, <laughs> you'd think I would know. Um, he probably has secreted about the skins draped over his wide rounded shoulders. Will his kind know how to make a canteen from the stomach of one of the animals he subsists on? Or do they always camp close to a creek or a melt? I hope this is a technology as yet undiscovered for him. I dearly hope this, as I know, in trade for the kindness of the Tupperware, I know that after tipping a long, warm swallow of his treasured water into his mouth, he will quite likely offer it across to me. And there will stand, his muscle-corded, densely-haired forearm, reaching not just across from him to me, but across the gulf yawning between our respective species. And don't think I'll be in fixated on the, on the infection or contamination that should be paramount in my mind. If either of us should be concerned with that, it's him, as I've had millennia of haphazard vaccinations and probably boiling with bacteria and viral material that would lay him over in under a day. No, what I'll be concerned with, that crude but functional canteen held between us the whole long while, it'll be his mouth and whatever's going on with his teeth there. And whether the, whether the short lifespan of Neanderthals isn't necessarily due to the brutal struggles of daily life, with no projectiles, their only recourse is to thrust with spears, which puts them in the range of hooves and antlers, tusks and shoulders. But if, this, but if the simple fact is that, with no dental hygiene, their teeth wear out long before their bodies, which combine that kind of rampant accelerated decay with the near certainty of a significant amount of incidental backwash, and this historical monumental offering from his era to mine, it becomes complicated enough that I cringe now, knowing how I'll be stranded there before him then, watching my own hand, wondering who it's gonna betray, me, him, or all of us. And understand, this canteen is far preferable to, far preferable to whatever meat he might have, clam have clamped in an armpit, or twisted in his hair, or stuffed alongside his leg, in those foot wrappings that won't quite be boots for another 10 or 20,000 years. So you're asking why I elected to stay inside today instead of, instead of the walk you recommended would do me good? It's because I'm polite. If I do stray out into the world today and happen to encounter a Neanderthal trotting along from yard to yard in his hunched, guilty way, my first instinct would of course be to make him feel less alone, less lost, to walk alongside him, to offer him some Tupperware. But this chance meeting, it would only lead to a regrettable situation, one likely to negatively impact relations between his kind and ours. So thank you very much for your kind advice, for your offer. Let's call it an invitation, shall we? But I think that for today at least, for today I'll be staying right here and keeping my own company again, letting the world out there continue on as it's already straining to. 
The less potentially damaging I can keep my interactions, the better for all involved, I have to think. Now, if you don't mind, I've got a sheep bladder hanging from a hook in the kitchen. Ha ha. It's calling my name, bleeding it anyway. I would offer you a drink, but well, by the look on your face, I'm beginning to wonder if we share a lineage anymore, or if we might not have branched down different paths ages ago, such that we only resemble each other now in the most superficial manner, due, I'm sure, to our common ancestor, Mom. Speaking of, tell her you tried, will you? That it was your turn to come visit me, and that you tried, but I kept rattling on about cavemen and the like. She likes it when my behavior is extreme enough that she can dismiss it as unexplainable, as an unsolvable mystery, a depth not worth plumbing, finally. And tell Madeline it is her turn next week, yes? Be sure to tell her that, if she wants, she can skip the visit, just make the story up from whole cloth. Whatever she imagines will only serve to fuel the fires of Mom's fears, which will in turn ignite the brush and perhaps chase my former self out into the dull orange glow of the world. I'll grasp my crooked spear low by my right knee and scuttle and shuffle along the egg of edge of the conflagration as always, my eyes pinwheeling around for danger. And eventually I'll find a rock overhang I can call my own for the night. And with my back spooned against the safety behind me, I'll extend my thick burly fingers out almost to the warmth at the outer edge of my make-do cave. And I won't let myself look to either side to see if the shadows I know and need have spooked out here with me or hiding just as I hide. But I know they'll be here. They always are. At some point in the long night then, instead of giving in to the sleep that wants to claim me again, wash me back and forth across the fanciful abrasive surface of my hopes and regrets, I'll most likely open my Tupperware one careful edge at a time, inspect my leg of chicken or shaved carrot, and proceed to gnaw at it with the beautiful savagery we all have inside us. <laughs> hmm. Let's see, I've been going 30 minutes. I'll read one more piece, and then, then I'll do. I'll answer whatever questions y'all might have about whatever. Um, about why dogs always die. Um, um this is about what well, this is about mongrels. And Priscilla, I may have read this when you were in Dallas. I don't know, so if you get bored, just play on your phone or something. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember. I don't remember what I read then. But um, what happened was my publisher for, for Mongrels, the werewolf novel, um, told me to write something for booksellers because they were sending me to some bookseller thing. And so I wrote this. And nonfiction is always a trick for me. I never really know what nonfiction is or how it works or anything. Um, so what I tell myself is just don't lie. That'll be nonfiction, you know? Maybe that is, I don't know. Um, I think there's still ways to spin it though, I suspect. Anyway, this'll be my last piece. For tonight, not, not forever, but <laughs> for tonight. Um, the fantasy part of all the werewolf stuff I read growing up and still read, it was never the claws, the teeth, the hunger. Is that they is it was that they were all always so flush. They never had to think, how are they going to buy this ticket to Istanbul? Their heart never dropped when they had to trash their third car that month. They were always walking away from these palatial estates and these jewel-encrusted daggers and from mysterious dragon hordes of treasure. My idea was always that if I were a werewolf, I would coax the hunters after me in hopes they would have silver bullets. We'd be in some construction site with lots of raw wood so that all their missed shots, I could come back the next day and dig them from the two-by-fours, melt them down into an ingot, make some serious scratch down at the pawn shop, if I could keep from getting plugged, that is. We all think that's the kind of werewolf we'll be, right? I'll be fast, I'll run through the rain and never get wet. Don't get me wrong, I get why werewolves have a full bank account in novels. It's because watching a werewolf in human form out mowing lawns that's not really what the reader's looking for when there's a werewolf snarling on the cover. Rigging stories such that werewolves always have total credit, it lets the werewolf exist at a level of drama where what's life and death isn't groceries. It's a vampire on a revenge arc. It's a society of trained hunters. It's a deadly pathogen or a long buried secret weapon or Nazis and on and on. There's always somebody stepping up to kill the werewolf. It's what stories do with monsters. What if the werewolf's just scraping by though? What if the werewolves like us? In 1987, at the fever pitch of Anne Rice's Tragic Vampires, a film came out that challenged our idea of elite monsters. Near Dark. 
When I saw this on VHS for the first time, I was smiling the whole way through. Here was a family of vampires who weren't wearing high velvet collars and sneering at all the cattle herded together at this cocktail party. Instead, they were living in a series of stolen vans with blacked out windows, just driving from town to town, using different scams to lure victims out into the darkness for a little teeth on neck action. These near dark vampires, they weren't dealing with feuds that had been started nearly three centuries ago, and they weren't searching for some holy relic that would give them back the sun, and they weren't investing in the stock market. They were just doing what they could to survive. They're far and away the best treatment of vampires I've seen. Here, finally, was a monster I could believe in. Here, a monster like me and mine. But in 1987, when I was 15, I wasn't having vampire dreams every night. No, in our little green and white house, way out in the country that our great uncle was letting us live in because we didn't have anywhere else that season, what I was dreaming about every night, it was werewolves. I could hear them running around and around the house. I would go to the window, look through that old warped glass, and know that that was their fur I was seeing in the darkness by the barn. And then if I quit watching, they were coming inside for my family. Fifteen was more or less the end of my werewolf experiments, too. Starting about 12 years old, living in my grandma grandparents even deeper in the country, I'd set about trying to become a werewolf. I scrounged all the methods I could from the used bookstore we went to in town every now and again, and then I'd time the full moon out so I could roll around out in the grass, wait for the transformation to ripple down my arm, punch claws through my fingertips. When the moonlight didn't work, I remembered a long-legged pale coyote that we'd seen out at the fence once just watching us. And in my mind, I squinted it into a regal, dangerous wolf. Told myself those were wolf footprints in the driveway the next morning, coming out of the puddle I'd made the day before with the hose. If you drink from a wolf print, you become a werewolf. It's automatic. It's a rule of nature. The water tasted like dirt. And all our big farm dogs had their faces right down by mine, sniffing at whatever it was I'd found. I tried the raw meat angle. It was like eating cold oatmeal with blood. I tried running naked through the mesquite, but mostly I just tried wish wishing. When you're 12, you want to be anybody else, anything. Werewolf, that was just my first option, and it was mostly for night. What I, what I wanted to be in the day, it was a kid with blonde hair, blue eyes, and a gold rope chain necklace. The necklace was very important for this new identity to work. Neither happened. I didn't become a werewolf. I stayed in Indian in West Texas where there aren't any Indians. But then I saw Near Dark and I'd already seen the howling about as many times as it's possible to watch a stolen VHS. And something clicked over in my head. I knew now that being a fantasy creature, it wasn't reserved for the Lestats and the Draculas of the world. There could be ordinary monsters too. There could be check-to-check -check werewolves.